All right, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining your hour with APA Virginia, sponsored by the Berkeley Group. Uh, your hour with APA Virginia is hosted on the fourth Monday of each month from noon to 1 p.m. I'm going to give everyone a quick minute to get in, get settled um, before we begin. All right, uh, thank you again for joining our webinar today. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to go over a couple of housekeeping items. Um, as we do every month, this webinar, APA Virginia Legislative Update, uh, will be recorded and posted to the chapter's YouTube page by the end of the day. We encourage you to visit our YouTube and see past webinars or share it with colleagues. As a reminder, we will hold um, all questions until the end, but as the webinar is going on, please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A box on your dashboard, and we will answer them at the end in the order in which they came in. Um, again, thank you to the Berkeley Group for making this webinar series possible. We are always looking for new webinar presenters or topics. So if you happen to know someone or happen to know of a topic that you are interested in learning more about, um, please do email us at admin at apavirginia.com. Again, that's admin, A-D-M-I-N at apavirginia.com. This month's webinar, APA Virginia's Legislative Update is presented by the following. Um, up first, we have Tyler Klein, um, AICP. Tyler is a senior planner with the Frederick County Department of Planning and Development. Tyler has previously worked from Loudoun County and the Northern Shenandoah Valley Regional Commission. Tyler holds a Master in Urban and Regional Planning from VCU and a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science and History from Virginia Tech. Tyler has served on the APA Virginia Chapter Board in various capacities as a Section Director, Membership Director, and VP for Chapter Affairs. Tyler is passionate about the role of planning, creating great communities for all. Up next, we have Joe Lurch, AICP. Uh, Joe serves as Director of Local Government Policy for VACO. He earned his Bachelor of Science degree in Geology from William & Mary and a Master's degree in Urban and Regional Planning from Virginia Tech. Joe has worked as a planner for the cities of Fairfax and Richmond and Spotsylvania County. He served as a planning commissioner for the city of Fredericksburg. His various professional memberships include the American Institute of Certified Planners, the Virginia chapter of the American Planning Association, the Virginia Rural Planning Caucus and National Association of Counties. Previously, Joe served as the director of environmental policy for the Virginia Municipal League and was a secretary and treasurer for the Virginia Energy Purchasing Governmental Association. Last but not least, we have Eldon James. Um, Eldon James has spent over 40 years working in and with Virginia state and local governments. Eldon received his BS degree in recreation resource management and his master's in urban and regional planning from Virginia Commonwealth University. He spent 17 years working in state and local government in positions with the Commission of Outdoor Recreation, the Cooperative Extension Service, and King George County, the final five years as county administrator. Eldon left King George County government to open Eldon James and Associates, Inc. in 1994 and has served as the principal of this public policy planning project and program management firm since then. The consulting firm's current clients include over a dozen Virginia localities, the Rappahannock River Basin Commission, the Virginia chapter of the American Planning Association, the Virginia Recreation and Park Society, the Virginia Association of Area Agencies on Aging, and the Virginia, Virginia Goodwill Industries Network. At this time, I'll go ahead and um, stop sharing and I will turn everything over to our presenters today. Tyler, are you uh, kicking this off? Yep, I'm just waiting for the first slide to come up, Eldon. Ah, well, that would be helpful, wouldn't it? How about now? Perfect, go ahead to the next slide. 
Well, uh, thank you everyone for joining us on our uh, update to the Legislative Assembly. We appreciate everyone taking time out of their schedule on a uh, busy Monday to uh, participate with us. So we'll kick it off with the 2021 General Assembly session statistics. There we go. So for odd number of years, the General Assembly sessions are typically what's known as a, sh a short session or 45 days. This year, uh, given the, the ongoing situation with COVID, uh, the session was actually shortened to 30 days. It was actually 27 days. And it included the regular sessions followed by a special session that lasted an additional 20 days. 1,389 bills and resolutions were introduced in the General Assembly session this year and 828 of those were carried over into the special session with eight of them passed. 736 passed uh, the special session and no bills were vetoed. Next slide. We're gonna walk through uh, the various planning related issues that were taken up by the General Assembly this year. And uh, we won't uh, go through all these slides, but let's go ahead and go to our first topic, which was solar energy and energy storage, and we'll pass it off to Joe Lurch. Thank you, Tyler. So this year we saw three significant bills that in their sum total, I think indicate um, the direction that the General Assembly of the legislature wants to take in granting localities uh, greater authority over the siting and conditions of what I call um, utility scale of solar projects. Uh, those things in the hundreds of acres, sometimes as much as a couple square miles. Um, the first bill uh, is House Bill 2201 and its companion 1207. And this has to do with um, the siting of solar and energy storage projects. And, and energy storage has come now into the mix um, through all three of these bills, um, which is an interesting development. But essentially last year, if someone remember, there was a bill that was granting um, localities host siting agreement authority for utility scale solar projects, those things greater than five megawatts that were locating in um, uh, qualified opportunity zone census tracts, which was a large portion of Virginia. It wasn't the actual designated tracts, just those that qualified. What this bill does is it opens it up to any project greater than five me megawatts uh, throughout the Commonwealth, so to any census tract. Um, so that's a big extension. Uh, it also um, clarifies that energy storage projects greater than five megawatts also need a host siting agreement. And I think what's important there to note is um, some of these energy storage projects and what we're talking about is um, chemical um, lithium ion battery storage typically um, um, can be a standalone project away from a solar. Uh, so they would need a host siting agreement. Now, what was interesting about the bill is it said it would not become law unless the next two bills that I, I'm going to talk about, House Bill 2006 and uh, Senate Bill 1201, it's a companion, uh, were actually become law. And so they're tied together. And essentially what 2006 and, and 1201 do is um, it, it now adds energy storage uh, systems into the tax exemption um, that's mandated from local machinery and tool tax, but it also allows for these projects to do uh, a local option revenue share um, for these uh, systems. Uh, and it's essentially kind of an energy tax at the local level. And that was also a bill from the previous uh, session. Um, the third bill that kind of wraps up this in the trifecta is it it not only adds a center, you know, it talks about solar energy projects and, and energy storage systems uh, as a part of being um, part of the revenue share, but it also, um, and if you, uh, Elton, if you can go to the next slide, I can, I can delve into a little more of the topic. Um, what it also does is for the um, uh, revenue share, it allows a locality to increase that 1400 per megawatt um, every five years um, by up to 10%. And so the chart I'm showing you here on, that you can see on the slide shows what that would be going every five years incrementally into the future up to that number you could charge. The whole purpose of this um, was to provide an escalator to kind of somewhat match uh, cost of inflation. And so with that, um, I'll stop and just say, like I said, in some total, all these bills kind of indicate the General Assembly wants to give localities more authority to work with developers on addressing issues on siding, 
but also greater options on how they address the revenue um, from these types of facilities. Let's move to a couple of land use bills. Um, and these first two, uh, HB 2042 and uh, SB 1393, dealing with uh, tree replacement um, and conservation during uh, development activities. Eh, perfect example of the evolution that occurs to a bill as it moves through the General Assembly process on that path from introduction to, uh, to passage. Um, as introduced, uh, these bills would simply give greater authority to um, local government to um, protect trees or require replacement, uh, especially in projects involving stormwater management uh, uh, permits, uh, areas in, of recurrent flooding, uh, formerly redlined areas, which was a new uh, criteria uh, this year. Uh, from others that we've uh, seen proposed in the past and for uh, uh, added compliance with the comprehensive plan. As it moved through the process and, and passed the House, the same bill was uh, added uh, a, an extended uh, date for uh, implementation, uh, meaning being effective July 1, 2022, to give everybody more time to deal with it. Uh, as you had further negotiations occur between the, the various parties, um, you had the final bill, which uh, required, in addition to what was just described, the secretaries of natural resources and of, the, of agriculture and forestry would convene a work group that uh, would bring all the various parties together to really address what should additional tree protection and replacement requirements look like going forward? And so why have a committee after you pass a bill? Well, they put a what's called a reenactment clause on the bill and the bill doesn't become law unless it's passed again next year. Now, what this means is you're gonna have a negotiation over the course of the next year. Uh, the various parties will hopefully come to some consensus, report back to the assembly, and there'll be a whole new bill that may have some of the similarities and, and maybe not uh that will be put forward in the next session of the assembly so uh stay tuned on this one and i'm going to turn alcoholic beverages over to joe thank you Eldon. so as eldon mentioned uh on the previous bill you know when things get introduced um there's a lot of changes along the way if we can go back to that slide thanks Eldon. um and what this bill originally had done, it would have allowed localities by ordinance to create up to three outdoor refreshment areas where you could have alcohol um, in open containers served by a local establishment. And each of these could have been up to uh, half a square mile in size. Where it ended up with um, was allowing a locality to adopt an ordinance that would then be able to petition uh, the ABC uh, board to uh, take the current special events permits and they've actually in law, they've changed it now to the designated outdoor refreshment areas and allows um, a locality to petition the board to uh, increase the number and the duration of these. Currently under law, um, a locality every year could have up to 16 of these events, um, no longer than three days. So this would allow a locality to petition a longer time frame um, and, and a greater number of uh, events. So it is interesting. Um, you have to include, you know, the size and scope of the area within the events that will be held, a public safety plan, and and any other considerations that the ABC board uh, will consider. So we'll, it'll be interesting to see how this moves forward. Um, you know, I think in terms of planning, you know, there's lots of things to think about. I know that in the original bill, I think one of the things that I, I was thinking about is if you start designating outdoor areas that are linked to establishments that serve alcohol you may be, you know, picking winners and losers because there may be certain areas where that wouldn't be um, uh, applicable and people have, you know, liquor licenses there. They may be losing some businesses to some of these. So some of the things to think about prob probably when you're thinking about implementing these. So that was it. Well, not nearly as exciting as consuming adult beverages outside. Um, House Bill 2054 uh, dealt with comprehensive planning and allowing the re reducing, modifying, or waiving local parking requirements 
to be included in the strategies when considering um, and promoting transit oriented development as part of the review of comprehensive plans. Uh, this bill also removes uh, some language regarding increasing development density in certain areas to reduce density in other areas, specifically the phrase to reduce density in others. Um, so there's an opportunity to expand planners toolbox uh, for encouraging transit oriented development. Next slide, please. And we'll hand it back over to Joe. All right, so I'm gonna talk about House Bill 2053. And this bill actually is kind of an outgrowth of a bill from a couple sessions ago that some may remember that failed that basically would have said that um, any um, residentially zoned property could be split into or have an accessory dwelling unit. It would have uh, basically mandated that. What this bill does is it actually takes a look at, okay, you know, what is the, the scope uh, and the applicability to address affordable housing um, and market rate housing by allowing um, or incentivizing uh, accessory dwellings, either internal or attached or detached. Uh, it's a particular issue that I think that some would like to see to address limitations in zoning. Um, so this bill is putting a study group together um, that's going to be headed up by DHCD uh, that's going to look at this and maybe provide some recommendations to the legislature. I think that's one that APAVA will be um, watching and maybe involved in. Uh, so will VACO and I'm sure as well PML um, to, to watch this. I will note that um, there is a bill from the 2020 session called uh, HB 854 that actually directs DHCD and Virginia Housing, formerly uh, VHDA, to look at overall across the Commonwealth uh, affordable housing issues. Uh, there's also relatedly um, the Joint Legislative Audit Review Commission, JLARC, which is an arm of the legislature is uh, going to be conducting a study with a report to the legislature in November to look at affordable housing, but particularly as it relates to zoning and any limitations in zoning. So that's a, another one to look out for, all three of these things as they move forward throughout the year. Thank you, Joe. I'm going to talk a little bit about HB 2320 and SB 1389, which uh, adds a disclosure requirement um, and, uh, and a um, direction to buyers to exercise due diligence uh, relative to flood uh, risk reporting. This amends um, section 55.1-703, which deals with your real estate disclosures, and it adds a new subsection D. Um, the, the subsection requires the real estate board to make available on its website a flood risk information form then explains how that uh, form is, uh, is to work and what's supposed to be on it. Um, excuse me, then amends subsection, uh, it, it, yeah, amends the bill, but then adds subsection uh, D, which deals with the real estate board, then adds an entirely new subsection, 55.1-7082, and that deals with um, a disclosure of repetitive loss structures and then defines those. Uh, the, uh, the, this is really the first time that the real estate uh, uh, associate, the Virginia Association of Realtors um, has really been willing to add a new disclosure to the list and they worked hard with the various stakeholders and, and agreed that a, uh, as defined in a federal uh, regulation, repetitive loss structure means two or more claims of more than $1,000 were paid out of the flood insurance program within any rolling 10 year period. And if you're a property owner and you're aware of that, you are required to disclose that. Um, so the, um, that's some progress in that area. It wasn't quite as broad as what the, um, uh, the bill is originally introduced, uh, but it was a, uh, a significant step forward on that kind of disclosure. I'm going to move us now to uh, talking about transportation. Um, this bill uh, began its uh, legislative journey uh, these bills, uh, HB 2071 and SB 1350, 
as requiring that resiliency become a factor in consideration of a prioritization through smart scale. Uh, as it went through the process, it became obvious that that was gonna be too hard to figure out how to do. And what ended up in uh, the final version of the bill is that uh, resiliency is an evaluation factor in projects in the six year program and will become a criteria in, for projects in the 20 year program. Um, it also requires the commissioner of highways to ensure that uh, resiliency is incorporated into the design standards as we go forward. All right, these next two bills, uh, continuing in the trend of transportation, have to deal with bicycle and pedestrian accommodations. Both House Bill 1841 and House Bill 2262 uh, specify the convening of working groups to identify issues and repair, prepare uh, reports on their findings. House Bill 1841 uh, specifically directs the Commissioner of Highways to convene a working group to determine whether there should be model policies for crosswalk design and installation, and if so, establish recommendations for such model policies. The working group uh, is requested to submit a report to the Governor and General Assembly by November 1st of this year, uh, with the hope that those findings could be incorporated into legislation in the next General Assembly session. House Bill 2262, uh, in addition, addition to convening a working group uh, related to allowing bicyclists and how they tr how bicyclists treat stop signs and yield signs, and to report those recommendations to the House and Senate committees on transportation. Uh, 2262 does not provide a timeline for the incorporation and preparation of that report on best practices, um, but we would anticipate that that would be, again, sometime this year with hope of getting legislation before the General Assembly in 2022. In addition, House Bill 2262 uh, makes one change to traffic laws and requires the driver of a motor vehicle to change lanes when overtaking a bicyclist or certain other vehicle types when the lane of travel is not wide enough for the overtaking motor vehicle to pass at least three feet to the left of the overtaken vehicle. The bill also removes the limitations on riding bicycles and other certain types of vehicles to abreast. Um, so those are significant change uh, to the rules regarding how motor vehicleists treat bicyclists um, in the right of way. Let's move to uh, in some environmental uh, related legislation, stormwater management. Uh, HB 1983 um, is an, an interesting piece of legislation. It, it, it developed out of a, a project that uh, I believe was from Stanford County where the developer was unable to find uh, wetlands mitigation bank credits that they could acquire so that they could proceed with the project and was actually going to, uh, to stop the project. Well, this caused some concern, obviously, in the development community, also concern for the local governments and how to uh, uh, continue to manage economic development uh, efforts if we're already hitting that wall and we're not even at the 2025 uh, uh, closing the gap on the Chesapeake Bay TMDL, because once we close the gap, cap, gap, we have to live under the cap. Well, if the cap is already, we're not even at the cap, we haven't gotten to that point and we, we're, we're impacting development. So what happened was the uh, development community, local government and the environmental community all got together to try to figure out a, a solution. And this bill was just that solution. Um, basically what you have uh, under this piece of legislation is that you, uh, you define a primary service area, which is where you would go to seek your, your credits uh, or your, your uh, offsets, well, I'll say credits, offsets, not the right word, pardon me. Um, but you also have defined in this bill a secondary service area, which broadens the geography. And basically it's anything outside the primary service area, um, as long as it's within the same uh, river uh, watershed and within the same physiographic region. Um, and this uh, allowed to deal with uh, uh, 
a problem that was going to grow beyond just uh, Stafford County uh, were it not addressed. Uh, so again, a compromise that was worked out in advance of the legislative session and uh, all uh, interested parties came into it in, a, in agreement. Um, the next bill, SB 1404, deals with Stormwater Local Assistance Fund, basically does uh, two things. Um, it allows the um, consideration of grain application uh, for its uh, impact on uh, total phosphorus reductions or total nitrogen reductions is one change. And the other, it mirrors what's done with, uh, with wastewater projects in that uh, if you have a locality that is uh, fiscally stressed as defined by the Commission of Local Government, uh, DEQ can actually increase or decrease the local match rate. Um, and uh, so that was a, a, a benefit that we'll, uh, we'll see come July 1 for, for SLAF projects. Um, moving a little farther into conservation, um, SB 1274 uh, wildlife corridors. Um, this bill basically just sets up um, that uh, state agencies are to consider uh, the impact on wildlife corridors when, uh, when they're uh, designing projects uh, and uh, that uh, Department of Wildlife Resources is to uh, uh, publicize the uh, wildlife corridor action plan on their website and then provide technical assistance to state agencies or uh, political subdivisions into how to utilize that as, uh, in their planning process. Uh, SB 1290, um, Conserve Virginia program. Uh, DCR is establishing a data-driven uh, GIS system model that uh, will prioritize potential conservation areas across the Commonwealth. It will rank them on uh, uh, their quantifiable benefits uh, to uh, the citizens of Virginia. And uh, aspects of the program includes uh, uh, synthesizing uh, uh, mapping data and uh, that, that demonstrates kind of the overarching uh, conservation value uh, of, uh, of one area versus another. It allows for some prioritization of areas that would be considered for conservation and requires the Land Conservation Fa Foundation uh, to report on the success of the program in driving their decision making and where Virginia Land Conservation Fund expenditures go. Uh, finally, SB 1374, the creation um, of a carbon sequestration task force by the Secretary of Natural Resources and the Secretary of Agriculture and Forestry. Um, and the, the group is to report back by the next session of the General Assembly and to look at such things as uh, possible methods of increasing uh, carbon sequestration in the natural environment through changes to state policy. Um, also recommending short-term and long-term benchmarks uh, for increasing sequestration. Developing standard methodologies to establish the baselines I uh, have some agreement there. There's some things that go on in the private sector uh, that have been done and uh, Virginia's to look at those things as well as some public sector programming and, and what are best uh, uh, ways to do that in Virginia. Identify existing carbon markets and uh, considerations relative to uh, uh, our potential for taking advantage of those markets, uh, as well as identifying funding mechanisms. And of course, that those last two kind of go hand in hand. Um, and with that, we're gonna move to some budget actions and I'm gonna let Joe kick this off. All right, thanks, Elton. So um, talking about uh, Housing Trust Fund, um, this is a big um, lift uh, by the General Assembly. Uh, it's more money than we've seen, I think, in the Housing Trust Fund um, in, in many years. I, I think it's when you combine that with, I think, a lot of actions at the federal level uh, under the Rescue Act, um, you're going to see a lot of resources coming um, towards addressing affordable housing uh, in Virginia, but also nationwide. Uh, the, 
close to $50 million per year for the broadband for the VADI, the Virginia Telecommunications Initiative grant. Um, the thing that uh, is interesting about that is there was also a budget amendment language that said up to 10% of the grant awards could go to uh, a local government that did not have a private sector partner. Because currently under the, the guideline in the budget language and in the criteria that it's uh, run through DHCD is you have to have a private sector partner that's providing uh, the connection to the consumer. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Elton. Okay, thanks, Joe. Um, some pretty uh, monumental uh, appropriations for Chesapeake Bay uh, cleanup uh, and, and remembering that uh, the, the horizon for accomplishing WIP 3 of uh, Chesapeake Bay uh, cleanup, or TMDL, is uh, the end of 2025. Um, and this uh, $200 million is divided, $100 million uh, for wastewater treatment plant uh, upgrades, and remembering that $50 million was already in the base budget. Uh, well, now the significance of that 150 million is the estimated amount needed of state match money for all the wastewater projects that are anticipated that need to be at least underway by the time we get to uh, 2025 is 300 million. And so what's in the remainder of this biennial budget uh, gets us halfway there. Uh, unless for some reasons those numbers have to change. Um, so it's anticipated that uh, if uh, the economy stays strong, that we'll see uh, another 150 million in wastewater funds in the next biennium, because that's the next, uh, that's really the last biennial budget shot before we hit the, uh, uh, the deadline. Uh, 65 million for ag BMPs. I think the ag community was looking for about 100 million, uh, but 65 is a big shot in the arm, 25 million for uh, local assistance, uh, stormwater local assistance fund, and remembering the, the uh, uh, changes that were made that actually makes it a little, a little more helpful to local government uh, to access those funds. Uh, continuing to support Solar Water Conservation District uh, technical assistance, which really supports that 65 million Ag BMP money is, is 10 million for continued technical assistance. Um, and let me do a, a little uh, uh, background uh, at this point. Uh, for those who are familiar with the, the history of that technical support from soil and water conservation districts, every time we would have an economic downturn, they would lose funding from the state uh, and they'd lay off technical assistance staff. And two to three years later, they're bringing the staff back on because the money's coming back. But then you've got a whole new group of faces and you've got to build whole new relationships with, uh, with the, uh, the ag community. And uh, soil and water conservation districts over a number of years have been saying, you can't do that to us. You're, you're, you're taking not just two years of lost work, but it takes another two or three years after that just to build things back up in terms of working relationships. And so this is a continued effort to really try to uh, bolster for the long term that technical assistance. Because remembering, uh, you know, I, I said it before, uh, once we get to 2025, we're living under a cap and we're going to have to continue if we're going to have economic growth to find new and better ways to continue to remove nutrients uh, from uh, uh, our uh, pollution of our, 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 our rivers and streams. Finally, uh, restoring about $12 million to DEQ's budget, which was in, um, in slightly different forms, but it was in DEQ's budget in the original uh, biennial budget, but then was peeled back. And then they've, they've kind of redirected those monies a little bit uh, uh, towards environmental justice and clean energy programs. And um, that uh, pretty much takes the community development side. Oops, how did I... I am having trouble with this advance button. Okay, let's move on to transportation. Um, 323, almost 324 million uh, was, was put into transportation infrastructure uh, in, in really one-time money uh, to, uh, to, to deal with some capital improvements. 167 million to expand uh, the VRE Manassas corridor and to continue to move things forward 
to extend passenger rail now that's all the way to Roanoke uh, out to the New River Valley. The long-term goal is to get it all the way to Bristol. Uh, 93 million the Hampton Roads uh, express lanes and to complete the widening of I-64 uh, between Richmond and Williamsburg. 32 million for Metro, uh, 11 million to uh, increase availability of statewide uh, fare-free uh, transit services. And remembering this is just gonna get us through the biennium. They're gonna have to continue to address that issue going forward uh, if it's determined that's the policy direction we wanna go. Um, so more to come on that issue. Uh, 10 million to expand and enhance multi-use trails. Um, and then uh, 10 million for 5G connected community redevelopment pilot at the Virginia Tech Falls Church campus. And for those who are followers of all the economic development up in, uh, in that part of the, the state, uh, you, you, they see that as a, a, a real necessity. Uh, for some of the big uh, jobs, uh, uh, projects that are coming in that area. Um, and with that, I'll turn it back to Tyler. Tyler, you're on mute. That concludes our 2021 General Assembly session. Uh, slide presentation, but we're open now to question and answer. And uh, Paige from APA is going to uh, moderate that. Paige, you wanna go ahead and throw us out the first question? Yes, uh, so our first question comes from George Humwood. Um, um, if he is still with us, I'll give him some time to unmute um, if he would like to ask his question out loud. Paige, go ahead and read it to us. Okay. Um, what is your best guess as to what the 2022 tree conservation bill will look like? Um, I don't have a best guess. I think that it really is going to depend on how uh, strong of an advocacy of the various uh, uh, points of view will be when the two secretaries set up that working group. Uh, this really comes down to a, a policy discussion between the two primary advocacy groups, which are the Builders and the Bay Foundation. And uh, this was Bay Foundation's uh, piece of legislation. They worked very hard at it, worked very hard to uh, keep it alive against some pretty strong opposition uh, to um, uh, yeah, I'll just say pretty strong opposition. Um, our next question comes from Steve Gleason. Um, do you know how the work bicy bicycling, sorry, work groups are being set up? Is there a process to join and participate, <clears throat> excuse me, and participate in formulating the recommendations? I do not have the answer to that question, but I'm going to ask that uh, send me uh, send me an email, and uh, I'll do some checking, and I'll get back with you personally on that. If you're interested in in serving or in putting forward somebody's name, we certainly want to help you do that. I would I would add to the working group comment. Um, APA Virginia is frequently sought at. Uh, to provide participants for working groups or special studies. Um, APA recently did one with the Joint uh, Legislative Committee for audits and review. Um, so if you are interested in participating in a working group with a topic, certainly send it uh, to legislation. APA Virginia will maintain a list. And that way, in the future, if we're inquired uh, to provide some names, we can reach out to those who are interested in a particular topic. Um, that may be the the best way to stay organized, but for the, the particular comment on this one, Steve, if you can send us uh, your your email, um, we will go ahead and follow up for you. Um, our next uh, question comes from Heidi Mitter. Um, do you know how the 10 million for trails may be allocated? I do not have a specific answer to that, uh, but here again, um, we can try to track down uh, that answer. Um, Heidi, 
send, send, say, say what Tyler said and what I said before, send, send me an email and, and let us do some, uh, some pinging and uh, see if we can get any kind of leads there. Um, this next question is for Joe. Um, can you please provide more insight into the workings of HB uh, 20, 2201 slash 1207? Sure. So, um, you know, I didn't go into too much detail, but it's a good question from, from Dave Maloney. You know, the side, host siting agreement that was granted to localities in this qualified opportunity zones from last year, uh, it really opened up the negotiation process between uh, a site developer and a locality in that you could not only address the impacts uh, related to the development, you know, it could be, you know, to, you know, stormwater, it could be to the roads where all this equipment is coming through that can damage them. But you could also get payments um, for things in your operating budget, in your capital budget. You could also get um, some investment into broadband. Um, as and, and why that's interesting is some of these uh, facilities that are coming in, they have to come in with some fiber uh, to be connected uh, with the hardening of the electric grid. And that presents an opportunity to have some unlit strands that could be available uh, for um, fiber connection uh, for broadband. Um, so that's how kind of that bill works. And, and what's interesting is that the development community um, wanted to go ahead and make this available to any project greater than five megawatts and then also to those uh, solar energy storage. Um, and, you know, and I think in looking at the chat, I saw a question from, from John Harbin that's kind of related to this, so I'll just address it, um, is you know, do localities feel like they have the tools that are necessary? I, I think time will tell, but I think in general to um, a lot of the localities where a lot of this is happening, I think they're starting to already take advantage of these. Uh, I know that a, a big host site agreement was done in Sussex County. I think one is uh, maybe currently under a negotiation in King and Queen. And so they're using these tools um, with the developers to address not only, I guess, the impacts, but also the revenue impacts uh, related to what the legislature had mandated as far as tax uh, um, exemptions on local uh, property taxes. Um, okay, so our next question is, how do solar revenue share M&T proffers and conditional approvals knit together at the local level? level sorry. So if, if I think I understand the, the question is, um, you know, in, in regards to revenue share and M&T, the, the best way to think of it now is that currently, unless you've passed a revenue share ordinance, um, you apply your machinery and tool tax on those facilities. Now there's a caveat here is that once it's a greater than 25 megawatts in size for a solar facility, but this could be for any generating facility, um, the actual rate that you apply is not your um, statutory M&T rate, it's actually no greater than your underlying real estate rate. And that could be very differing rates for, for localities depending on where you are. So that's kind of the baseline. But if you wanted to um, go with the revenue share model instead of the M&T, you could adopt that ordinance which gives 100% uh, exemption on the M&T, but you do have the revenue share. And I think some of the, um, uh, you know, the why why localities might like this uh, route better is that you know every year what that will be per megawatt cost. Whereas under M&T, uh, and particularly as it gets above 25 megawatts, because then you have to go by depreciation schedules that's provided by the State Corporation Commission, that gets involved. In terms of, of proffers, um, you know, Typically, I, I don't think these have been rezonings. They've been more special use permits um, for these. So it's really conditions. Um, so it's more the conditional approvals. But then you also weave in now the host side agreement and it's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of really opened up um, the things that you could ask for from a developer or things that a developer could bring to the table in order to get local approval. Okay. Um, next question we have, um, HB 1778 clutter removal. Um, 
clutter removal bill, sorry, did you discuss this? We, we did not. Um, it, uh, I'm gonna uh, just simply say it's not very clearly defined in the bill what clutter is. Uh, so I would suspect that we will probably have to see more about this one going forward. Um, uh, experience tells me, and I'm going to invite Joe to, uh, to, to, to add to this after I go ahead and say it. Experience tells me some city or county, probably city, because uh, since this was a request by the city of Hampton, is going to uh, construe clutter in a way to get rid of uh, what somebody thinks is an eyesore and somebody else thinks is pretty important. And they're going to end up in court and it's going to lead to further legislation or people, somebody's so upset that, that another bill is introduced to further clarify. It, I was a little surprised as it went through the process that it stayed as broadly written as it was. Yeah, you know, uh, Elton, I'll just add, you know, maybe to provide context for those that weren't necessarily um, watching the bill. So it, it allows you by ordinance to add, um, you know, clutter to the things that you can regulate and, you know, provide a fine for. And it defines clutter as um, including mechanical equipment, household furniture, containers, and similar items that may be detrimental to the well-being of a community when they are left in public view for extended period or allowed to accumulate. So I think to your point, Eldon, it, there's a wide range of interpretation. Um, I, I do know that, you know, a, a lot of the um, agricultural uh, lobby interests were concerned, although it, it, it accepts it for active farming operation, I think they were still concerned about Yep. maybe agriculturally zoned properties that, you know, might have a house and, and they could get caught up in it. Um, it did seem to, uh, it wasn't passed overwhelmingly. It was probably, and I haven't looked at the, the final numbers, but it, it looks like it could have been passed along partisan lines. And I think that may be more due to, you know, the representation coming from an urban area where they really are trying to deal with issues of visual clutter that could have a detriment to the community uh, and that people want to see addressed in, in particularly in, in, in urban areas, dense urban areas. I, I was fully expecting that, that there was going to be a push uh, that would be successful to amend it, to limit it to maybe just cities and, and not, not counties, but and you know, that just didn't happen. All right, next question. Um, can you speak to the marijuana bills and possible impacts for local land use? Oh, goodness. Um, well, you know, we, we were going to have till what, 2024? For, uh, you know, for the, the commercial activity aspect of it doesn't take effect to 2024. Um, but then you had it the last minute and the whole, the whole bill wasn't going to take effect till 2024. It was going to be all that time to kind of figure out how to set up the, uh, regulatory infrastructure, et cetera. Um, but then, you know, the governor introduced the, the personal possession of an ounce or less. And, um, uh, you know, that passed in the, um, uh, veto session, um, that adds some wrinkles um, but the bill as written, I read as giving local government some pretty broad authority relative to the land use aspects of it. Now, that, that's not speaking to some of the other aspects such as um, employment and, and the, the city or county's workforce and those issues. And then what about the public safety aspects of the so you, you, there's more to come on this they worked really hard to set up the structure it's a it's going to be a private market in that you're not going to have public abc style stores owned by the state they're going to be private stores but they're going to be heavily regulated the same way alcohol is by the abc board and they worked very very hard on that whole aspect of it but i don't think they uh uh, and they're trying to figure out how to determine 
how a driver would be considered under the influence when it's questionable whether there's any kind of testing that exists. Now, part of the point of why that sounded scattershot is because there are broad reaching impacts of this that a part of the reason why it wasn't gonna be fully enforced until 2024 is to figure out what all those ripples are. You've got employment issues, as well as land use issues, as well as commercial business I issue interests, you've got, um, you know, how do you uh, regulate the uh, driving public? Uh, how, you know, so I'm sure that didn't help a whole lot. Uh, we're going to be figuring this one out over the next several years, and there'll be much more. Uh, but I will come back to uh, matter of fact, Joe, I think you and I had this conversation late in the legislative process. We don't see much restriction on local government authority relative to the land use aspects. Yeah, it actually in the, in the bill itself for the new section dealing with the control, you know, authority that's being set up. Right. While, while they can grant these permits for, you know, uh, cultivation, manufacturing and retail, it does clearly state that localities still exercise all the power that they have under chapter 22. And so it's like any other land use, right? You know, if it comes in in a zoning district and it may require a special use permit, you got to go through those processes, um, you know, to get that approval. So even though you might get a permit, it'll be interesting to see when the, uh, the new authority is developing its regulations. And I think something that would make sense, like the state does with other permitting processes, is that you show you have the local approval for the location of the use. Uh, so that'll be interesting to see moving forward. And I think related to that, um, and I'll touch on a uh, referendum as aspect in a second, but I think what's gonna be interesting to see is the cultivation, and it's a unique property of, of the marijuana plant. It's the only plant that not only can take 24 hour sunlight, but thrives on it. And so, you know, for cultivation, I think there might be uh, a move to maybe locate these in warehouse districts where you have a lot of floor space and you can bring in grow lights and control all the conditions. So you might see some applications in more for the cultivation, big operations. Um, in, in regards to the referendum, the way we've analyzed all the um, amendments uh, or the enactment clauses is that basically if a locality wants to ban retail sale, um, they could do that by referendum in the fall of 2022. So you'd have to have it as a local referendum. If the voters say no, you could come back in five years and examine whether you want, on, want to open it up again. But it is important to note that I think it's up to 640 retail license will be issued by the authority. Mm -hmm. I think if, you, if, if the voters say no, and you, you, you know, retail sale is not allowed for the first five years or I forget how many years. Um, if you come back and open it up for retail by referendum, the voters say yes, all those permits may be gone by that point, unless the board opens up more permits or the, the legislation opens up, up more permits. Yeah. So there's a lot of interesting aspects there, but I think the, the, I think what you'll see not only as the regulations develop, you may see tweaks to the legislation in the coming years before 2024 comes. Yeah, and I'm gonna to speak to that in just a second. And I know we're starting to push in on time. I think there's also the potential for a 3% local tax. Sorry, yeah, I totally forgot about that. Don't forget, you know. Yeah, optional local percent. So if, if yeah, if, you know, if you don't uh, buy referendum ban it and you have retail happening, you can collect a, a local optional 3% uh, sales tax. Now, there's one other wrinkle in this. And it's not something that people other than who are sitting on this end of the, of the uh, presentation would think of. The state is creating a new highly heavily funded lobby interest. And as that lobby interest gets off the ground with their army of lobbyists, don't think that local land use law as, it, as we just described it is going to remain static. It's going to be like any other lobby interest that has a concern about local land use regulation. They're going to be coming at us uh, down the road. Uh, and that's my crystal ball prediction. Okay, Paige, back to you. Okay. 
Um, do you believe there will be any effort to designate broadband as a utility? Um, all right, I'm gonna give you my opinion and then I'll let Joe or Tyler speak in. No, um, there, it, it isn't just that simple. Um, if, if you're declared a utility, there are things, there are advantages mm -hmm. for the utility and there are obligations. And those obligations um, run counter to market forces the way that the, the broadband industry operates today. Um, and uh, so I, the, the industry will fight that tooth and nail. Um, and so I, I don't see it happening. Yeah, um, I don't see it. And I don't see it happening in Virginia, but I, yeah, that's yeah. But and and for a lot of reasons, because I think um, and and I think there's the, the part of the problem is the genie's been let out of the bottle. In other words, you have all these private interests that have all their infrastructure in to deliver the internet, and if you switch to making it a regulated utility, how do you divvy up those assets and allocate who's the incumbent? I think there's a lot of issues there. Having said that. I think there's a big national push to what do we do to a lot of rural urban areas that are just not being served. And there's been a lot of comparison to the Rural Electrification Act. Um, what's gonna be interesting is the um, Biden administration's uh, infrastructure bill um, that they're gonna be trying to get through Congress in the coming months. Their first blush is 100 billion nationwide uh, to invest in broadband, not only in uh, rural unserved areas, but also in urban areas where affordability and speeds are an issue. Um, and I think when we've talked to some administration folks, their proposal, they haven't totally fleshed it out yet, but some of that might be in grants, but some of it might be in long uh, term 30 year low interest loans. And that's very similar to the Electrification Act of you know building all that infrastructure. So I think in a way, while I don't think it'll ever be designated particularly as, as a utility, it'll get a lot of favorable treatment for building the infrastructure uh, from the national and, and, and the state's levels. Um, and, and I'll piggyback on, on what Joe just said. Um, it's not gonna become a utility by action that Virginia takes. If federal preempts that, that's, that's a different, and that was what I was, the, the point of view I was answering the, the question from. Uh, Virginia is going to continue as long as it can afford to invest in it because it's the only way uh, that they're going to get to those unserved and underserved areas uh, because it really is both uh, and not just unserved. Paige. Some perspective on HB 1374 would be great. Um, our locality is thinking about carbon. What is the state wanting to do with that, with the report information? 1374, that was the task force, right? Um, okay, some perspective. Um, you know, we're in, in a whole new environment here in Virginia, recognizing carbon sequestration markets. Um, you've got, Virginia is now part of REGI, so we're part of a regular, uh, which is the, uh, uh, the regional uh, group that extends from here north uh, up to New England. And uh, so we're moving into that, uh, uh, that, that regulated carbon uh, marketplace. Uh, but there are also voluntary markets out there. And um, you've got major worldwide corporations that are investing hundreds of millions of dollars in, uh, in buying offsets to their carbon uh, footprint. And um, you know, you've got Shell Oil is probably one of the leaders. Their board of directors at the end of 2019 uh, invested the first $300 million into starting a, a program to make the, make the company from uh, one end of its supply chain to the other carbon neutral by 2050. Uh, that's pretty extensive. And, and I'll just use them as an example. So there is money out there looking to buy offsets. 
Uh, there's a program uh, that we're trying to get off, that's the Department of Forestry is involved in trying to get off the ground in Virginia, where to try to capture some of that money to pay forest landowners to keep their land in forest rather than convert it, because it was a great strategy for, for their long-term goals, where they were seeing 16,000 acres of uh, forest land a year converted to primarily residential use, but to other land uses. And uh, Department of Forestry goal is not only good forest management, but it's also the forest pro products industry. And to lose forest land permanently to, uh, to houses, they're never gonna, gonna get that back. So they're looking, and that's part of what has spurred this effort on, because you have some state agencies working with others uh, out there trying to figure out how to, uh, to capture some of those assets that are out in the worldwide market. Um, so, uh, anybody who's got the interest in that and they want to have more conversation, I, I, there's more I can tell you than we have time here. Okay. Um, or, well, let's see. We are right at one o'clock, but we have one more question. So I'll just go ahead and ask that to round everything off. Um, with the interest of some localities in removing bus fares for the next few years, it is possible for... <clears throat> for a local government to move forward on this without legislative action at the state level, I presume not since state monies, I think would be needed to put this into action. Um, you, you have the recognition at the General Assembly level to, to try to continue to, to uh, help with that situation. Um, my recommendation is for that kind of question is to be talking to uh, the folks at DRPT, uh, Neil Sherman, Jennifer Jabril, um, they're right in the middle of that whole discussion. They're the, the chief people that the, that the legislative staff go to to uh, uh, determine how much they need uh, in order to do those sorts of things. And I, I would be talking directly with, with them. And if you uh, have any, any issues with uh, who to contact or how, again, communicate with us and we can, can set you up there. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just add, you know, it is interesting. I think what the pandemic has opened up is the possibility is, do we need to be having all this infrastructure and administration for collecting fares when they really don't provide that much towards keeping the operating system going? And I think there's a recognition among some in, in, in um, DRPT and others that, hey, maybe we can just do away with this. Uh, it is interesting to see how that goes moving forward. I'm going to take that one step farther, Joe. Um, in, in some of the discussions that have gone on relative to this topic, the pushback was, well, why should the state be subsidizing those, those fares? And the answer to that was, well, why did you subsidize the roads out into the rural areas in the first place? And so, you know, it's, it's, it's an equity. It came right back as an equity issue. Um, so um, that's part of what yeah, the pandemic revealed that and brought these these discussions forward in a whole different way. Um, and uh, I think it's a realistic debate going forward of whether we should even have them. So there you go. Okay, well, that... I, think, I think Tyler's got one more slide, though, we're going to wrap up with. Okay. I know everyone's uh, anxious probably to take their lunch or get back to work. Um, so we Okay. We end one general assembly session and we, we start looking forward to the next session. Um, there are some issues that are going to be returning to 2022 that will be uh, hot topics for discussion. One is uh, environmental justice and how it is included in, in comprehensive plans, access to affordable housing, and mentioned earlier, uh, JLARC, the Joint Legislative Audit and Review Committee, has uh, been conducting a review of housing needs, and that is anticipated to be completed in 2022. Um, APA Virginia did participate in a couple of roundtables with JLARC, and uh, we are anxiously awaiting uh, what those housing findings will be, and we will be sure to share that with you all um, at this time that it's released. We also ask that you be mindful um, that there are still issues. Uh, there are issues coming in 2021 that are going to impact the General Assembly session 2022. Obviously, census data is going to be released, and that may lead to some redistricting. We also have uh, 2022 as an election year in the Commonwealth, and uh, they're obviously, you know, control of the General Assembly, the governor's office, lieutenant governor are all up for grabs in 2022. 
Um, so depending on what happens with those elections is going to significantly impact uh, what, what may be achievable and what may be a hot topic in the 2022 General Assembly. We also have the 2022-2024 biennial budget, uh, again, growing the economy and taxes, uh, push to meet those Chesapeake Bay TMDL demands, transportation funding again. There's a never ending need and, and it will be a, a big part of the budget. And then uh, re-benchmarking for the uh, K through 12 schools. Um, we do need participants in our legislative committee. Uh, it's been something that was defunct for several years, but we we're hoping to reinvigorate that and have monthly meetings uh, starting in May and through the next general assembly session. We will use the general assembly, sorry, the legislative committee to talk about uh, those issues that are priority uh, for APA members, informing our white paper, and then also uh, going into the legislative work for the General Assembly in 2022. So if you are interested in serving that committee, please send us an email at legislation at apavirginia.com. We'd like to get you on our list. And again, uh, check the newsletter for an announcement of when that first legislative committee will be held. Again, we're anticipating it to be uh, Friday in, towards the end of May. So um, appreciate everyone's time today. And uh, we look forward to working with you all uh, throughout the year. And here's our contact information. Uh, the presentation will be sent out to uh, meeting participants uh, shortly after this call. It'll also be posted on our website. Thank you. Paige. Um, that's all that we have for you today. Um, thank you for joining us. And like Tyler said, we will get this uh, slide deck sent out shortly and we will post the recording to the chapter's YouTube page by the end of the day. Um, thank you again for everybody that was able to join us and thank you to our uh, presenters today. Thanks, Joe and Tyler. Thank you, Paige.